So there I was, in the middle of the Great Barrier Reef, crying. Hey there, and welcome to Ticket Before You Kick It, a podcast about helping you conquer your adventure bucket list. I'm Alexandra, your favorite traveling mermaid and adventure blogger, and this episode is Swimming with the Fishes, talking all about the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Stay tuned for my personal experience and review, some fun facts, other helpful information, and maybe even my infamous whale story. Don't forget to read more and sign up for the newsletter at thebucketlistmermaid.com for more bucket list inspiration and travel resources. Now let's get bucket listing the Great Barrier Reef. This is a mermaid's dream and I cannot wait. Let's go. I don't know why, because I always had the heart of a mermaid and my parents got married underwater, so I was kind of forced into this diving life. Oh, poor me. But I always thought that the Great Barrier Reef in Australia was the creme de la creme of scuba diving. Funny story, I was actually in high school and I told one of my teachers that I wanted to go scuba diving on the Great Barrier Reef and they told me that I was crazy and I was going to get eaten by great white sharks. Now, spoiler alert, I did scuba dive the Great Barrier Reef eventually and I did not get eaten by great white sharks. So take that high school teacher. Now, this is one of the seven wonders of the world, and it is actually the world's largest reef system. So it's no surprise that this was hyped up in my mind from a very young age, and I knew about it at a very young age. I mean, God, you can like see it from space. That's crazy. Now, just some fun facts. The Great Barrier Reef has almost 3,000 individual reefs and 980 islands, and it stretches over 2,600 kilometers. This means that there is a wide variety of fish and marine life there for you to go live out your best mermaid dreams like I did. Now let's just continue on with some fun facts about the Great Barrier Reef because when you think about it, it is so impressive what it actually is. In fact, it could fit the size of 70 million football fields. Yep, I said that right. 70 million football fields. There are way too many species to count. In fact, there are more than 1,625 species of fish, and there are 10% of the world's fish species that do inhabit this reef. That includes 30 species of whale, dolphin, and porpoise, six species of turtle, and over 600 species of soft and hard coral. If you're wondering where the coral actually comes from, it actually comes from polyps, which I didn't actually know. And they have a symbiotic relationship with algae, which means they absorb light from the sun and then they feed coral and they give them their bright colors. So they're actually nocturnal and during the night the polyps come out of their casing and then catch any small creatures passing by. They only spawn once a year when the polyp releases its genetic material into the water and a single polyp can start an entire reef. Another fact, the Great Barrier Reef is one of the most popular attractions in Australia. Now, judging from the fact that I knew about the Great Barrier Reef from the moment I could talk, this tracks. So let me just quick talk about my experience with diving the Great Barrier Reef, and I wanted to cross this off of my bucket list so much that I flew to Australia specifically to cross this off of my bucket list. I actually flew into Cairns. I think that's how you pronounce that. If you're in Aussie, I'm so sorry if I'm butchering that, but it was a great little town, and I ended up staying at a party hostel, which was hilarious because I was so exhausted from traveling and I wanted to dive, so it was great. But anyway, I ended up going with a company called Diver's Den, and they picked me up from the hostel. They took me out to the boat. The boat ride was nice. It was like two to three hours long, and there were so many people there. Like previously, when I had gone on dives, it was a pretty small ship. It was a pretty small boat, and then you just basically went out with your group. But with this, they had multiple groups going at a single time. They split us up. Since I was traveling solo at the time, I did get paired with a buddy and then another married couple. And there was just so many things going on at once. There were dive masters talking to each group individually, and then you would go off and then they would pair you for a wetsuit and all of your gear. It was a little chaotic, but I kind of loved it. Another thing that I really liked about this company was they kind of just let us go. Like we got to come up with our own dive plans. We got to kind of go wherever we wanted to go. So it was definitely less of a guided experience than I was expecting. I had actually been previously training to be a rescue diver equivalent through BSAC, which is the UK version of Patty. So I was kind of hyped to create my own dive plans and plan my own decompression stops. So this freedom was really, really fun for me. And it kind of made me feel like I was 
was taking this bucket list activity into my own hands. Obviously, they were keeping us safe and they had photographers and all that jazz, but it was really cool to be able to take control like that. I ended up going on a two tank dive. And funny story, this was actually the first time I had gotten my ear wet in like three months because I actually had gotten surgery on it three months before in Vietnam. That's gonna have to be its own episode of Travel Story because wow, I saw so many species of marine life. I saw parrotfish, I saw whales, I saw sharks. There were so many species of fish and marine life that I saw on these dives. If you are a diver, you know that there's a little section in your dive book where you can write where you saw. I actually ran out of room to write everything that I saw. And now for my great story. So I was diving. I was just doing my own thing. I was looking at all the fish. I was taking some photos. And then all of a sudden my dive buddy, who, as I said, I had no clue who she was previously to this because I was traveling solo at this point. She just like grabbed my arm really tight. And I just immediately thought, oh no, what's wrong? What, what happened? What, who do I need to save? <laughs> you know, like my mind automatically went there. And then she looked out ahead and there was a whale, like an actual whale. Now, for those of you who have dived and have seen a whale, I don't know why it was just so magnificent in my brain. I lost it. I just, it was huge. And I had gone whale watching before in, you know, like Boston and Fiji and all these places around the world. But to see a whale so close to me underneath the water, it was kind of it was such an emotional experience and I actually started crying in my goggles. Who does that? So there I was in the middle of the Great Barrier Reef crying underneath the water. And it was just the coolest experience ever. Now I did talk to the dive master afterwards and his best guess to what kind of whale it was, was a minke whale, M-I-N-K-E, whatever it was, it was beautiful. And I just thank it for giving me that experience. It was, it was so emotional. It was so amazing and oh, bucket lists, bucket list adventures just coming true here. So yeah, then after that we went up, I actually ended up cutting my finger pretty bad on coral, which I still have a tiny little scar from. Oops. But yeah, I just chilled on the boat. They had this really nice relaxing front area where I could see everything and it was so fun watching all the divers go down and seeing all the snorkelers. Oh, 10 out of 10 it was just my dream come true from the moment that I was little scratched it off finally. Now the fact that I did see a minky again, hopefully I'm saying that right, whale tracks because I was there kind of in like late summer, well, you know, my version of summer. So in, you know, like August, September-ish area and this tracks because from June to November, this is the best time for seeing the minky and the humpback whale spawning as well as that coral spawning that we were talking about. Now, if you go in April to September, this is going to be for manta rays and hammerhead spotting from December to February. This is going to be the best visibility and the warmest water. And then from August to December, that is going to be less rain and wind and pretty good visibility. I think when I go next time, I would like to hit that that April to September area because I would love to swim with a manta ray while scuba diving. I've done it while snorkeling. I have not done it while scuba diving. That's that's on my list next. Also keep in mind that if you do go during summer, now this is backwards in Australia, um, so this is going to be November to May-ish. This is also stinger season. Now, I did talk to a dive master. Now, he said that it wasn't a huge deal because of where they go and it's pretty touristy and they do provide stinger suits. However, they are quite nasty if you do get one. So maybe avoid that if you don't want a stinger encounter. But it's also like a catch-22 because December to February is the best weather and the warmest water. So you kind of have to pick and choose what you're willing to risk in order to get the best experience. But generally, it's kind of nice because the Great Barrier Reef is good for all year. It's great. So I ended up going in September area and I thought it was great. I thought the water was warm. I didn't run into any stingers, obviously. I really had no complaints with the visibility. I thought the visibility was great. I thought the, the weather was warm. So yeah, I think no matter what you choose, just be aware of the risks as with all diving and marine life when you are interacting with marine life and you'll be good to go. Now, another thing I do have to mention that I did not learn until I got there is that you can actually get to the Great Barrier Reef from several towns on the eastern coast. I ended up going from Carnes, Cairns, oh god, please help an American out. 
this is painful. So I ended up going from Cannes, which is honestly probably the most popular port to embark from on your Great Barrier Reef adventure. I thought that it was great. I also thought that there was a lot to do within Cannes itself. For example, when I wasn't diving, I ended up going to this really cool waterfall. I saw a platypus. I swam in a lake with alligators in it. I rafted Tully River. Um, so there's a lot of good things to do that are a good distance from Cairns, and it is a pretty good port. I had no complaints with going to that one. If you did want to go to some place a little bit less crowded, you could also leave from Port Douglas and Townsville. Now, I did talk to a diver on the boat there, and he said that the reefs from Port Douglas had a little bit less coral bleaching, and they were a little bit more alive, which I do believe, because I think that if you are going from Cairns, it is going to be very popular and maybe since it's more popular there's a lot more people in the water at all the reefs that are accessible from Cairns but if you go towards Port Douglas or Townsville you might get to go to those reefs that are not accessible from Cairns and you might get less crowds and less crowds unfortunately means that the coral might be a little bit more alive. Also PS I am going to link a bunch of tours from these different locations in the show notes on my blog at thebucketlessmermaid.com and then I also have them in my main Great Barrier Reef post. So definitely head over there if you want to check out your options for all of the tours. I also have some budget-friendly hotels, some medium budget hotels, and some luxury hotels that I've put in there so that you can decide where to lay your head after or before your dive. Now there are several popular dive sites in the Great Barrier Reef that you can go to depending on which port you are leaving out of. And I'm just going to list a few just so you get some inspirational ideas of where to dive in the Great Barrier Reef. You can go to Agincourt. This is on the northern end near Cairns and is perfect for beginners. You can see the Wonder Wall where the coral drops 40 meters or 131 feet. So cool. Another popular location is the Sundays Islands. This is 74 islands that are basically a paradise for divers and there is diving of every single level there. So another one which I thought was really super cool was MOUA which is the Museum of Underwater Art and it's known for its underwater greenhouse at the John Brewer Reef which is super cool that you could just go to a museum underwater. Like, how's that for a bucket list? Super cool. Some other ones, the Capricorn and Bunker Reefs. This is 22 reefs that offer a plethora of incredible bucket list experience. It's for all divers, and one of the most popular among snorkelers and divers is the Fitzroy Reef. I've even heard of that one. Super popular, super famous. Another one, if you are if you are looking for wrecks, I would definitely check out the Tangaluma Wrecks, which is a cluster of ships off of the Moreton Island. These ships are now home to a wide variety of marine life and some of them that I've never even heard of like and I'm again gonna butcher this I'm sorry Aussies Wobagongs and Dugongs oh man rough. Or the SS Yongala Stripwreck. This one is for more advanced divers because of the currents, but it actually sank back in 1911 due to a cyclone. And next, the Wonder Reef, which is just off the Gold Coast. It has nine underwater sculptures, and it's actually the world's first buoyant dive site. And now, let's talk about some tips for actually diving the Great Barrier Reef. I would definitely remember some seasickness pills. The company that I went with was a pretty large boat. As I said, there was a lot of divers that were congregating on this boat, However, it was a little choppy at some points, and it might be a couple hours outside of the town that you depart from, so the last thing you want to do is to be worried about getting seasick, and just don't do it. Just bring some Dramamine. And next, ah, oh, behold my own bucket list. Consider a liveaboard. Ugh, I did not get to do this, but if you have, please contact me. I want to talk to you, because if you do a liveaboard, you can sleep on a boat and do like two to three tank dives a day. Ah, oh, it's just like, sounds so nice. <laughs> and next, definitely talk to the dive guide about any potential hazards that you're going to run into. Maybe wear a stinger suit if you are there from October, November until May, or just ask your dive master about any concerns that you have. Funny story, one of my favorite stories of this was the first time I went scuba diving, I talked to the dive master and it was like a fire urchin or something like that. And he was like, oh, you want to guess why we call it a fire urchin? And I was like, no, thank you. 
<laughs> so, so just make sure that you know exactly what you're getting into and to not mess with a any of the wildlife really, but definitely don't mess with the ones that will mess with you back if you provoke them. And next, think about renting an underwater camera. Now my company was super cool and I actually bought a photo package with them where they gave me sort of all the photos that they had taken throughout their dives and then they also had the opportunity to rent an underwater camera and I didn't really think it was going to be that big of a deal, but man, there were so many photo opportunities. And if you have any interest in underwater photography, then you definitely need to bring an underwater camera. If you're just there for the experience, then don't worry about it. It's not going to be a huge deal if you don't have one. It's just if you are interested in it, I would definitely go with a company that can provide you with one or just bring your own. Now, just some things to keep in mind that I would advise you to is again, just see what seasons bring what. If stingers are there or certain species species are there. I go into more detail about stingers and the type of stingers that they have in the blog post if you are interested. And next, some reefs are very crowded. Again, I mentioned that this is Australia's biggest attraction. So you're going to have to compete with a lot of crowds, especially if you are going on one of those more favorable seasons. But again, you could also depart from one of the lesser known ports such as Townsville to gain access to the less traffic dive sites if this is a huge problem for you. I'm going to be honest, again, I was there in September. I didn't really notice it when I was in the water. Like I didn't see a lot of divers. Maybe we just kind of went off the beaten track a little bit because we were a little bit more advanced. However, on the boat, there was a lot of divers there. It was crazy, but kind of cool because I got to meet so many people and I don't know about you, but divers are just fun. Like I've never met a mean diver. Shoot, now I'm going to jinx it. Okay, if you're a diver, just don't be mean. We have a reputation to uphold here. We need to be the cool laid back type. And also another thing, if diving is not your thing and you are not certified to dive, there are other ways to see the Great Barrier Reef. For example, you can go snorkeling. Although you might not be as immersed in the Great Barrier Reef as I would personally like to be, I think that it is definitely a good alternative if you do not feel comfortable scuba diving. Because some people don't. It's a little claustrophobic. I get it. I do get it. Next, if you don't want to get wet at all, I would highly recommend looking at the flying tours. There are several tours, again, that I've linked in there for you, but you can take a helicopter over the Great Barrier Reef. You can take a plane. You can see this from space. So seeing it from up above is going to be an amazing experience. Or if you want to get super luxurious, which I actually tried to do, but it was all booked at the time, there are reef suites where you can actually go into your own underwater suite and you can just look at it like while you're falling asleep, like the whole hotel room has a view of the Great Barrier Reef. If that's not bucket list inspiration, I don't know what is. And another thing that I do have to touch on is how you can protect the Great Barrier Reef because unfortunately at one of the dive sites that we were at, there is a lot of coral bleaching and a lot of people that are ruining it, unfortunately. So here at the Bucket List Mermaid and Ticket Before You Kick It, we're all about sustainable travel and letting future generations have the opportunity to go on these adventures just like us. So some of the things that you can do definitely make sure to only use ones that are reef and coral friendly. So another one, shower before you enter the water and don't use any beauty products. I promise that the fishies will not judge you for not wearing makeup and try not to touch the coral. As I said, I did cut my thumb on the coral, so sometimes it is unavoidable. However, it is your responsibility to be trained enough so that you can leave as little trace as possible. Again, sometimes you can't really control it, but you have to do your best. And who would I recommend this to? I would recommend this to avid divers and also people who love marine life and wildlife, because this is going to be some of the most diverse wildlife you are going to come across. And also there are a lot of rumors that it is kind of dying. However, I didn't notice this a ton. I thought it was booming. I thought it was vibrant. There were some spots that were dead, but this is really, really an incredible reef to go. I think the only reef that I saw that was in better health was one that I did in Fiji. But if you are interested in diving one of the biggest reef systems on earth, then this is definitely something you gotta do. Now again, I have put a bunch of tours and a bunch of resources in the show notes and in the made blog post, which I will link. Some of these links are affiliates just so that I can get a small commission to keep bringing you free content. But definitely check it out if you are interested in checking this off your bucket list. 
And as always, if you do this, I love these pictures, especially if you get underwater pictures, so please let me look at them, indulge this mermaid, and connect with me on social media at thebucketlistmermaid.com so that I can cheer you on in all your adventures. Thank you guys so much for listening to this Bucket List episode about the Great Barrier Reef. If you did enjoy this, don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform or maybe consider leaving me a review. It takes two minutes and it means the world to me. Thank you again so much for watching and we will see you next time. Go forth. Go forth to the Great Barrier Reef. Swim with those fishes and keep adventuring.